Hi everybody. <clears throat> it is Laura from Green Tree. Obviously I'm not at Green Tree right now, but it was a bit easier to film this uh, sitting in my dining room uh, than to come down and try and do this at the store with all the traffic and everything. So I am going to kind of walk you through all of the basic things that people like to make over the holidays, or at least quite a few of them. I'm, gonna, I'm going to try and hit all the main points. It's hard. It would be hard to cover every single dish that everybody might want to make, but I'm going to try and hit all the basics. And if you have a question about something that I don't cover, let me know. This one might be kind of long, so bear with me for as long as you can and feel free to circle back through later uh, and check it out when it's done if that works better for you. All right, so first things first, um, if you're looking at this and thinking, you know what, I don't want to make any of these, we do have a catering menu and you can just order dinner. So that's an option if you find yourself getting overwhelmed. But I'm going to dive into this thing. We're going to start with um, the main dish, which for most people tends to be turkey. And then we're also going to touch on all the vegan and vegetarian alternatives to that and some of the other ways that you might approach your main dish. And then we're going to start diving into all the sides and the various cooking tips you might find useful. So again, if you have any questions, uh, throw them out there. I don't have a ton of props for you guys because we're only working with things that I already had in my own kitchen, but I will do my best to give you visual aids where I can. So first things first, you've decided to cook a turkey. Um, first, you gotta pick one. Decide what size you want, um, the number of pounds that you want per person, however you wanna tackle that. Basically, everything I'm telling you in relation to a turkey will also work with a chicken. So if you really want it to be smaller, go ahead and get a chicken instead. But I am going to dive into all the things you can do with leftover turkey. Um, personally, I really like having leftover turkey. Sometimes I'll even buy a second one just because they are actually a lot cheaper per pound than um, beef or lamb or a lot of the other local meats that you can get year round. And so it's nice to kind of take one of those and repurpose it into a whole bunch of meals. But we'll dive into leftovers later. First things first, you got a turkey coming. Is it frozen or is it fresh? If it's fresh, you just saved yourself a whole lot of work. You wanna make sure you cook it within five days um, and you want to make sure that it is kept really, really cold the whole time from when you pick it up until when you cook it. There are probably giblets inside. Take them out before you cook it. <laughs> it's gross and it won't cook right and you'll have weird papery bits inside of your turkey or your chicken if you don't remove those before you start your cooking process. <laughs> so even if it's fresh, make sure to remember to remove those. Now let's say you get a frozen turkey, which is super convenient and maybe, like I said, you might pick up two while they're in season and available and freeze one and need to thaw it later. So either way, this is useful advice. If you're gonna thaw it in the fridge, if you have enough room to thaw it in the fridge, Thaw it as close to the bottom of the fridge as possible. You don't want a bunch of other food below this thawing poultry in your fridge. If there are like those vegetable drawers underneath, like my fridge has the vegetable drawers underneath that bottom shelf, you can't get it all the way to the bottom, put something under or around your turkey. Put it in some kind of large sealed plastic bag, set it on a platter, put it in not the dish you're gonna to use to actually cook it, but a similar kind of baking dish or a cake pan, whatever. Don't just leave it sit on the shelf where it can ooze onto things. That's gross for a million reasons and just not a good idea. Okay, so if you're thawing it in the fridge, you've got it safely ensconced in some kind of container and or on the bottom shelf where it can't get on anything else. You wanna plan for about 24 hours for every five pounds of frozen turkey. Um, in terms of thawing. And you never really want to thaw turkey in the fridge for more than five days. So if you've got like a 30 pound frozen turkey, you're probably just gonna have to start cooking it when it's not completely thawed, or you're going to have to finish the process in a water bath. So the water method of thawing turkeys is faster than the fridge. It's hard to say exactly how long it will take. That depends on the size of the turkey, but probably only an afternoon versus days. If you are going to thaw your turkey in water, get like a five gallon bucket. It doesn't really matter if it's food grade so long as it's entirely clean because you're going to put your turkey or your chicken into some kind of sealed plastic bag. 
you don't want this directly in the water with the bucket because then all of that water is potentially contaminated afterwards and you that's harder to get rid of and could potentially spread around your kitchen and cause foodborne illness issues, which we really want to avoid right now and always uh, if it can possibly be helped. So a clean bucket large enough to hold the whole turkey and have it be completely surrounded by water and then seal that turkey in plastic. Once you've got it in there, you wanna make sure that water stays cold. Like it should be at 40 degrees or below if at all possible. And you wanna change that water out once every 30 minutes. That will keep your turkey cold enough while it's thawing. If you thaw it in water, cook it as soon as it's done thawing. You don't wanna be thawing that and then throwing it back in the fridge for a day or two. If you're gonna thaw it in the fridge, commit to that. If you're gonna thaw it in water, commit to that, but don't go switching back and forth um, between, like you can't go from the water back into the fridge. You can come out of the fridge and finish thawing in the bucket if you run out of time. So, oh, and again, once it's thawed, take out the giblets. You can use them to make gravy, or some people will use them in different kinds of stuffing and things like that later. Personally, I set them aside and use them for soup because if I'm going to get a whole turkey, I'm going to use a whole turkey. Um, and that's my preferred thing is to use those to make, make stock and soup later. Okay, so you've got a thawed turkey with no giblets in it. Yay, we are making progress. Um, again, this still applies if it's a chicken, it just isn't gonna take nearly as long. Okay, so there's a bunch of different ways to cook a turkey. I, there's a million. So I'm gonna give you kind of my favorite way and then some of the basic guidelines that you have to hit no matter how you cook it. First things first, you should probably get yourself one of these if you don't already have one. This is a probe thermometer. I don't know if I can get it to focus on that. Probably not, I probably need to clean my camera. <laughs> but anyway, this is a probe thermometer. You can get fancy electronic versions. Um, this is just the type that slides into a little sleeve, which I lost many, many years ago, um, and then pops right into the turkey or whatever else you're temping. If you are cooking raw meat or something with raw eggs in it, it's not a bad idea to have one of these around. They're pretty cheap. They last forever. I mean, I've literally had this one for more than a decade. Um, when you are done with that turkey and you think it's starting to be cooked, you're gonna put this into the thickest part of the bird, which is the thigh, or if you're doing a bone and breast, the breast. I actually usually check both spots. And you want that thigh at its thickest point to hit 165 degrees. That's how you know it's done. It doesn't matter what color it is. It doesn't matter if it looks juicy or dry. If it's at 165 degrees, it's cooked. So that's your, that's your metric, and it's a lot easier to determine that with a thermometer than it is to just by eyeballing your turkey. The other thing is you wanna cook it at a minimum of 325 degrees. Personally, I cook mine a little higher. I actually cook it at like 350 to 375. I like it done a little faster, and there are ways to still keep it from drying out. Okay, so we're gonna go into some of the, oh, I should also probably talk about stuffing. If you are going to put the stuffing inside the turkey, that changes things. Personally, I cook it separate. I find it's easier and faster to just cook it on the stovetop as I get towards the end of the process than it is to stick it inside the bird. But if you want to cook your stuffing in the turkey, don't put it together and have it sitting out on the counter at room temperature for a long period of time while you're prepping this turkey and then like pack it in there so tight it's like a stuffing brick. That is an excellent way to give yourself food poisoning. If you want to put your stuffing inside the turkey, have all your various ingredients set aside, and when the turkey is otherwise ready to go in the oven, combine all of those stuffing ingredients and put them in the turkey loosely. You want it to be kind of fluffy and loose in there so that there's some room for that hot air to flow around it. If you cook the Happy Thanksgiving, RJ. <laughs> Thanks for tuning in. Um, if you decide that you are going to cook it in the bird, you also need the probe thermometer for that. You'll be wanting to check not only the thigh and possibly the breast of the turkey, but you wanna get this as far into the center of that stuffing as possible. And the stuffing will also have to be at 165 degrees because if it's been inside the raw turkey, there could be raw turkey juice in it. And if it hasn't reached 165, it's not safe. So if you're cooking the stuffing in the bird, it needs to come to the same temperature as the turkey in order for both to be done. 
Okay. Now, we've got our turkey and we want to make it gorgeous and delicious. Personally, instead of stuffing, I like to throw lots and lots of garlic inside of mine. So I'm going to really quick explain to you how I cook my turkey and then I'll hit on a couple other methods. So when I get a turkey, and this is not something I do super often because local, happy, you know, well-raised turkeys are only available at certain times of the year. So when I can get one, I get one. Now, I like to take out my guts, as previously discussed, don't forget that, and then I rub the outside and the inside of the turkey with olive oil. You can also use butter. I just like the way that the olive oil interacts with the rest of the ingredients better, but coat it inside and out with your preferred kind of fat, and then I get like a small handful, similar to the amount of olive oil, of salt. And I rub the outside and the inside with salt. Um, I use regular like classic um, real salt. You know, it's that sort of brownish looking sea salt. And I rub all the way over the inside and the outside. Then I take all these fabulous cloves of garlic. You can also do this with herbs. Sometimes I'll do herbs and garlic. Take and, and peel all your garlic cloves and snip off that little hard end. And then I'll take four or five of them and stick them under the skin of the turkey, like between the skin and the meat of the turkey. And then I'll throw a few inside and throw in the, a few in the bottom of the dish. I actually like to scoop all of those nice chunks of garlic out later and have them as basically an extra side dish. Um, you, your mileage may vary on garlic, but personally, I really love it. Then, once I've got this turkey all rubbed down and delicious, if you are going to do a higher temperature, you are going to need to cover your turkey and add some liquid. This is what I like to do. But if you're going to do that, you need a rack. It doesn't really matter which kind, so long as it has, because they come like, you know, bent in the middle and different stuff. But it's got to have these little, my depth perception is off, these little legs that are gonna hold that turkey off the bottom of the pan. So if you're gonna have extra liquid in there, you don't want the turkey just sitting down in that liquid. You want it lifted up a little bit because otherwise it's going to be virtually impossible to take this turkey out of the pan without dumping liquid everywhere because it's gonna be so soft when you're done. So I'll set it on top of one of these guys and then I pour a mixture of Pinot Grigio doesn't necessarily matter what brand. I just like this particular wine because it's dry but relatively bright and light tasting. Um, so it adds a lot of flavor to the gravy without, um, without kind of overwhelming it with wine taste. So I'll put some Pinot Grigio and a little bit of turkey or chicken broth in the bottom of the pan along with those chunks of garlic and I like to chop up a whole container of mushrooms and throw those in the bottom because it gives a great flavor to the gravy and again, you get to scoop out those mushrooms and garlic and have that as like an extra bonus side dish. So once I've got all of that in there, I'm going to cook mine breast side down and I'm going to cover it because I like my turkey to be cooked through relatively quickly um, and have a lot of flavor and moisture. I don't particularly care if it's brown, although you can do that at the end even if you use this method. But if you're going to cover your turkey, use parchment paper. Don't just put tin foil right over the top of the turkey. It will stick and you will have weird little bits of foil stuck to your turkey and that's gross and also really annoying to remove. So I will take a chunk of this parchment paper and lay it over the top of the turkey and then tent it with foil. So this is doing kind of a protective layer in between and then that foil is sealing the moisture inside. Then I pop the whole thing in the oven, somewhere between 350 and 375. And depending on the size of your turkey, you can begin checking it at about three hours. So I, I wrote this part down because I do different sizes different years and I don't want to forget. Um, so you're looking at probably, if you've got a 10 to 25 pound turkey, three to five hours. If you put your stuffing inside the turkey, it could take up to five and a half. Um, at like the 325 range. Personally, like I said, I cook mine at about 350 um, and I usually get like a 15 to 18 pound turkey and it only takes two and a half, three hours at that higher temperature. Um, I usually don't start checking it until about hour three regardless of the size of the turkey because you want time for that flavor to get in there. 
But around hour three, if you've got a turkey on the smaller side, like in that 10 to 15 range, you can start checking the temperature. Um, don't go constantly uncovering your turkey and, and basting it. If you are doing this lots of liquid in the bottom method, just leave it covered until you're pretty sure it's about done. And then you can just uncover it for like 10 or 15 minutes and let that skin brown up and crisp up a little bit. Personally, I don't care. I'm saving the skin to make stock anyway, and it doesn't matter what it looks like because I cut it in the kitchen and then bring it to the table. But if you do want it crispy, give yourself a little extra time at the end where you can pull off that foil, pull off the parchment paper, this stuff again, not wax paper. For the love of all that is good and holy, do not put wax paper on top of your turkey. <laughs> Use parchment paper. It's meant for those temperatures and you won't end up with a weird, gooey, half-melted, floppy mess on top of your turkey. Don't use wax paper. I'm very serious about this. It's like removing the giblets. Two big, big no's. Don't leave the giblets in. Don't use wax paper. Um, so anyway, once it's reached this temperature, you're gonna take it out of the oven, and even if you cooked it uncovered, this is a really good time to put a loose cover over the top, whether it's like a loose tenting of foil, if you have a large dish you can set over the top, if you have a big enough covered roaster, cover your turkey and let it sit for about 20 minutes. If you've done the method that I did where you've got extra liquid in the bottom and you have it on a rack, you can lift the rack out of the pan, set it on a cutting board, and then throw the cover over the top of that and take all that liquid out to make your gravy. If you used citrus or wine when cooking your turkey, I know this is a lot of information, guys. Feel free to ask me in the store or questions in the comments if you miss part of this. But if you use wine or citrus in that liquid, you will end up with incredibly delicious gravy that never gets super thick. It just will not get super thick because of the acids that are in those things. So it will taste fantastic. It's worth it. There's methods using like lemons to cook your turkey. Um, adding a little acid to the cooking process is super delicious, but don't expect your gravy to get really thick. But okay, we've got to the point where your turkey is resting. It's covered. You got 20 minutes. Take whatever those drippings are. Do not get rid of them. If you have gone through the trouble to cook a whole turkey or chicken, save those drippings. I suggest making your gravy from them rather than getting the canned or the packet kind. You basically take all of your liquid, pour it into a little saucepan on the stove, bring it up to a simmer, and add a thickener. There's a few choices. I'll talk about that in a second. And then you whisk it. You whisk it until it gets as thick as it's going to get or as thick as you want it, depending on whether or not there's an acid in it. If you don't want to make your gravy from it, if you got a brand that you love, there's a packet or a jar or whatever, and that's your go-to gravy, fine. Still save those drippings because you can make broth or soup or a bunch of other things with them later. They're an amazing flavoring agent. I also like to add some of it to my mashed potatoes, assuming that I am cooking for a crowd where nobody minds eating uh, the turkey portion. If you are trying to make your um, potatoes and other sides vegan and vegetarian to be appealing to a broader range of audience, then definitely just use them in the gravy or save them for stock and don't put them in the potatoes. All right, so thickeners for the gravy. I'm just going to go through literally the whole thing, you guys. <laughs> Hopefully you can bear with me. And again, feel free to ask questions if I don't get to something you want to know about. Um, probably the easiest one and that pretty much everybody already has on hand is just to take some flour. White works better for this than whole wheat. Take a couple scoops, scoops of flour in like a little prep dish and mix it really well. If you've got a tiny whisk, use that. If not, like a fork or a spoon with cold water and keep slowly mixing it in until it's as smooth as possible and about the thickness of pancake batter. You don't want it to be super pourable because then you're adding a bunch of extra liquid to your gravy that doesn't have the flavor. Um, but if it isn't able to really be poured, you'll end up with lots of chunks in your gravy. Uh, you can also do the same thing with cornstarch. It's a little bit more of a learning curve. I would start with a couple tablespoons, uh, depending on the amount of liquid you have, and you're also going to want to mix that with cold water if you want to avoid chunks in the gravy. But cornstarch does this weird thing where the best way I can describe it is as it sits, it kind of settles and you'll have like this thick portion in the bottom of the dish that you can feel sort of sucks on your spoon. Um, so you just want to stir it like right up to the second you start pouring it into the pan and kind of stir it as you go. As you're pouring your thickener in, whisk. 
like whisk as you are pouring because otherwise you'll end up with like stringy little gravy dumplings which is not appealing so you want to pour and whisk at the same time once you get all your thickener in there you can kind of just let it bubble until it gets to the temperature you want but i like to whisk it a bit so long as i have time because you can feel the texture and the thickness of the gravy that way um, I believe you can also use arrowroot powder to thicken your gravy. I have not tried it, so I would probably suggest Googling that to get exact proportions. I usually use flour or cornstarch, just whatever was handy at the moment, because by the time it gets down to making the gravy, I've got like eight dishes going, <laughs> and I don't want to look for another ingredient. Okay, um... Once your turkey has kind of set, most of the rest of your stuff should be getting done. We'll tackle those dishes in a minute. Then you can go ahead and slice it. If you cooked it the way I suggested with the extra liquid in the bottom and covered for most of the time, you can basically just grab the turkey and lift the breast off. It will come off in a piece and you can just slice it into slices and throw it in a dish and bring that to the table. You'll be able to just pull the legs off too. Like It's going to come apart. You're not going to have to work very hard. If, however, um, you've cooked the turkey in a method that involves less liquid, maybe cooked it uncovered, again, if you're going to do it uncovered, that's when you want to go with those low temperatures, like 325. Don't go below that. It doesn't get hot enough, fast enough to prevent foodborne illness. So minimum 325. But anyway, if you've done it in a way where that turkey is a little bit firmer and less wanting to fall to pieces, then you're going to want to take it and slice I guess I would say the easiest way to describe it is in the same direction as the bone that runs between the breasts. So you're going parallel to that. Start on the outside, go all the way in slices until you start hitting the bone, do the other side. Yes, spatchcocking is another way to do it. So RJ also mentioned spatchcocking. You basically need poultry scissors to do that. Um, you can do it with a chicken or a turkey. But in, there's a lot of tutorials for this on the internet, but once your turkey is fully thawed or your chicken is fully thawed, you're just going to cut down the center and take out the backbone and then just kind of pull the turkey open flat. You've got to have a larger pan for this, so make sure that you're picturing your turkey or your chicken as being bigger than it actually is um, if you're going to do a spatchcock method. But you just pull it open so it's flat and it takes a lot less time to cook. You can still use the method that I suggested where you rub it down with olive oil or butter and then salt and stick your herbs and garlic under the skin and that will totally work. Um, you could even cover it and do the drippings and the gravy and the wine the same way. So um, if you're getting creative and trying some different methods, there's a million different flavor combinations available on the internet. You can always just go classic, rub it down with that, that salt and fat and some poultry seasoning. Get yourself a good solid handful of poultry seasoning and rub the whole turkey down. That will work just fine. Um, if you're looking for flavor combinations, there's a million on the internet. I just wanted to cover some of the basic techniques. If you are cooking it uncovered, you probably do want to baste, but you don't want to do it very often. Definitely not more than every half hour or so, because every time you open the door, the temperature of the oven drops and it will take longer to get your turkey done. Okay, now we're going to jump into the sides. I'm gonna start with mashed potatoes because they are near and dear to my heart and literally my favorite part of Thanksgiving. If you said you can't make a turkey or you can't make a chicken, that would be fine. But if you told me I couldn't have potatoes, we would be fighting about it. So, mashed potatoes. There's a bunch of different ways to go about this. I'm gonna hit the basics. First is your from scratch classic. Get yourself a potato. I mean, like more than one potato. Personally, I don't, I think that like three pounds is the minimum amount of potatoes I'm gonna mash because I, I love them and I will eat them out of a cereal bowl later. Like <laughs> Potatoes are my jam. But anyway, um, you probably wanna consider at least a half pound per person that you're cooking for. So you get your potatoes. Um, this happens to be a purple potato because that's what I had at home. Um, and decide whether you want like a, a more of a rustic style mashed potatoes or the classic creamy smooth. If you want the more rustic style, just wash them and cut them into a couple decent sized chunks and boil it until it's soft. If you want the classic creamy smooth potatoes, peel before chopping and boiling. Um, RJ cooking bags, that's very similar to what I was suggesting with the parchment paper. Um, 
it, it works quite well. It's an easy way to do it. I just usually have this already on hand, so this is my method. But like anything that's keeping the liquid kind of to the turkey or the chicken is going to make the make it a lot easier to cook it without drying it out. So I, I would say there's nothing wrong with that. It, it, it also helps keep the temperature from not fluctuating as much if you are opening the oven because it's keeping that hot air right close in next to the, the food that you're cooking. Um, so yeah, go for it. All right, so if you want the smooth, creamy kind though, peel before boiling. I pretty much suggest if you are doing mashed potatoes, boiling is the way to go. Roasting them, you're gonna get some odd texture bits and it's more effort than is really necessary. So what I'll do is when I know that my turkey is getting up towards close to done, when I think I probably have an hour or less left, um, I will take and throw my potatoes on to boil. Because it'll take 20 to 30 minutes for a large pot of potatoes to be boiled to the point where you stick a fork through and they're soft. Now, you can totally peel and prep your potatoes ahead of time and have them in the fridge. Same thing with sweet potatoes, green beans. Like you can prep most of your produce well before the turkey goes in the oven. You can do it the day before, um, or you can do it while you're cooking the turkey if you're not worried about entertaining company. So it just kind of depends on what your workflow is like. Personally, I don't usually have the day before that I cook off. So I will first thing, get my turkey already put in the oven and then start working on stuff like peeling potatoes, um, peeling some extra garlic because I probably want it for something else besides the turkey, uh, snapping my green beans, peeling my sweet potatoes. Sweet potatoes won't take as long as the classic mashed potatoes, so do these first. All right, so once they're boiled and they come out, you wanna drain them. And personally, I don't ever wanna have to heat them back up again. So I'm going to take those boiled potatoes once I've drained them and throw them straight into, if you have one, a stand mixer. If you don't, I would use a large metal or ceramic mixing bowl. Um, don't, don't use glass for this because there's a definite potential for temperature shock. So once you've got them drained, throw them into your, your stand mixer or your mixing bowl. And then I will add some of the liquid from the turkey because by the time these are done boiling, if you've timed it right, your turkey's coming out and is ready to rest. So I'll throw in a couple ladlefuls of that cooking liquid. If you are not using uh, drippings or if you're doing a vegan or vegetarian roast, which I will be looping back to, um, then you can go ahead and use a little bit of broth, your preferred flavor of, of vegetable broth or whatever um, turkey or chicken broth that you've purchased, and you can put a little bit of that in there. I also like to use uh, full fat unsweetened yogurt. You can also use sour cream or cream cheese. Um, you can use the excellent like sour creams from Tofuti or Kite Hill if you want to use a vegan version. But something that adds a little bit of fat and tanginess is a really good idea in those potatoes. So you've got a little bit of the cooking liquid, a little bit of some nice delicious fatty dairy or non-dairy unctuousness, and you're gonna throw that in there and turn on the beater. You can walk away and do something else if you are using a stand mixer, or you can just use the hand mixer and smash it. Personally, I don't like to use a milk or a non-dairy milk. I think you get a better flavor combination from that um, broth and then thicker dairy combo. But if you are going to use milk, then maybe skip the broth because you're gonna end up with potatoes that are kind of soupy in texture. Start with less liquid than you want. You can add more as you're mashing, but you can't take it back out again. And it's basically impossible to dry the potatoes. Um, oh, and also avoid overboiling. Like I said, you wanna be sticking a fork in periodically. And as soon as they're cooked through, take them off because once they get waterlogged, you will end up with weird waterlogged mashed potatoes too. Then, once you're done with those, what I will do is your oven is probably still warm uh, from your turkey, and I will throw a cover over the container that I have those potatoes in. This is again why I suggest metal or ceramic rather than glass, and I'll just throw that to the side in the oven and leave it there so they will be warm until everything's ready to serve. This is also a great time to put your sweet potatoes in the oven. Um, we'll come to that next. Now the other way you can do mashed potatoes, because sometimes we gotta prioritize, is potato flakes. 
do not underestimate the beauty that is potato flakes. I like the Bob's Red Mill. This is the one we carry. I particularly like it because if you can kind of see from the side here, it's only potatoes. There's nothing in this but potatoes. There's no other flavors or anything else like that. They have some really pretty easy instructions on the back. They're super simple to make either um, classic or vegan. You know, they, they call for um, unsalted butter, salt, cold milk, water, and the flakes. Personally, I actually use yogurt instead of milk. Again, because I like the flavor. But basically what you're doing with this is you are heating up some liquid with a little bit of fat and salt in it, taking it off the stove, stirring in these potato flakes and some dairy or non-dairy equivalent. And in about seven minutes, you'll have a bowl of mashed potatoes. You can vary the amount of flakes that you add. I usually add slightly more than it's called for because I like a thicker, stiffer potato. But in any case, this is the fastest way to get mashed potatoes other than having somebody else make them for you. There is zero shame in going this route with mashed potatoes. If you do not feel like peeling and chopping and boiling your potatoes and doing all those steps ahead of time, just save yourself an extra saucepan and make them this way. You're still going to have mashed potatoes and at the end of the day, that's what matters. <laughs> so. We've got our mashed potatoes mostly handled. Sweet potatoes is a very common uh, side dish. You can just buy the kind that are canned and in syrup and do those. I personally find them way too sweet. Everybody's comfort level is different on that, but it's just as easy and honestly usually cheaper to buy a sweet potato, peel it, chop it into a couple of chunks, and boil it just like you would with one of these. You can do this the day before. You can do this the evening before because it does not take very long. Boiling sweet potatoes go a lot faster than regular potatoes. I mean, maybe 15 minutes, um, I guess, depending on the size of chunks, but that's a super easy one to make ahead. So what I do is I just get however many sweet potatoes I want to eat. This is also the advantage over canned. You can either make a ton of them or literally one sweet potatoes worth and just use a little ceramic dish to bake it in. So you can decide how much of that side you want. Um, it's one that can be kind of divisive. But anyway, I boil my sweet potatoes. Once they're cooked, I toss them in maple syrup and butter, you know, vegan butter if you like, a little bit of cinnamon and ginger, and throw them in a casserole dish. When I'm ready, when I'm like, okay, everything is gonna be done within the next half hour or so, I just throw them in the oven to warm up. If you want to, throw some vegan marshmallows on top or some regular marshmallows. And I prefer the dandies, the vegan ones. I think they're really tasty. And just put it in the oven. Because they're already cooked through, you only have to have them in long enough to get warm. You don't actually have to worry about having those those sweet potatoes in there baking for hours. I mean, it's just like with the canned ones. If you pre-boil them, it's just time to heat. You don't have to worry about cooking them through. So my suggestion on the sweet potatoes is, is it's not that much harder to peel one and you can really control your portions a lot more. Okay, um, I'm gonna circle back to vegan roasts really quick. There are a bunch of different kinds. I think we have at least five in this year. We've got the Tofurky Feasts, we've got the Gardein Stuffed Roasts, um, there's one from, oh, I can't think of the name of it, but they make the, um, the little like uh, pulled pork and the pit boss chicken that's vegan. Um, we've got one from them which is called a Thrive Roast. We've got the Field Day and Crout Roast and the Field Day Celebration Roast, and we have the Corn Roast. Um, which the corn roast has a really nice texture, but it does have egg protein in it, so it's vegetarian but not vegan. Uh, we also have tofurkey hams, which are surprisingly good. As someone who doesn't particularly like ham, um, the little tofurkey hams are actually pretty tasty. But the general rule with all of these, they're going to have very simple cooking instructions on the package, is that you want to be careful not to dry them out. The biggest danger with a vegan or vegetarian roast is overcooking. I mean, this is the same as true if you decided to make your own like mushroom and nut loaf or like a bean bake or anything like that. Don't overcook. It's also another place where the, the um, probe thermometer is super, super helpful. You want it to get up to the safe cooking temperature. Each company will list that on there. 
but you don't want to let it in longer than you have to because it gets dry and chewy. That's pretty universally true for all the types that I've tried. So the probe thermometer is your friend when you're making those vegan roasts too. If you don't want to get one of the pre-packed ones, um, there's a lot of really good recipes out there. I recommend uh, Post Punk Kitchen, Isa Chandra. She has these um, seitan chickpea, like, turkey cutlets that are really good um, and you can make those in a frying pan so even if you don't have an oven if you're cooking some of this on a on a, like a hot plate you can still make those uh, they're very tasty the only thing that's a little bit trickier when you're making the vegan ones is you're not going to have the drippings for gravy i really suggest a mushroom based gravy you get a delicious kind of umami flavor for that you can leave it chunky and leave the mushrooms in or scoop them out and have a side dish um, probably the easiest way is to saute up a bunch of onions and garlic and mushrooms in the preferred vegan butter of your choice. Um, scoop out the mushrooms and just kind of puree everything else. Add some broth and thicken as you would with uh, any other type of gravy like I suggested earlier. So yeah, with the vegan roast, just be really careful of not overcooking. Treat yourself to a probe thermometer regardless. Back to the side dishes. <laughs> Green beans. I'm gonna be honest with you guys, don't hold it against me. I don't like green bean casserole. Just not a fan. Um, but if you love it, if you really love it, the one piece of advice that I'm gonna give you, don't use canned green beans. They're all smushy and weird. I mean, like, they have their place, but for a fancy holiday dinner, treat yourself to frozen or fresh. Um, you're going to get a better finished texture. The beans will hold together and you won't end up with kind of a green squishy paste. There's also a lot less salt uh, than if you go with the canned ones. Personally, what I like to do is I'll take my fresh green beans if I can get them, frozen if I can't, snap the ends off, snap them into pieces if they're really long. And this is again something you can do that part way earlier in the day or the previous evening and just have them in the fridge rinsed and snapped. Um, and then I will just take those and I will heat up a little bit of olive oil in a pan, throw the green beans in there with some slivered almonds and garlic, and just saute them until they're as done as I like. Um, a little bit of cracked fresh salt and pepper over the top if you like, and that makes a really excellent side dish. It's super fast, it doesn't take up extra space in your oven, you do need to get a pan involved, but this is again something you can do at the end like while you're boiling the potatoes. Um, you can also do Brussels sprouts in a very similar manner. You can roast them in the oven once you put those sweet potatoes in, or you can do them on the stovetop, like I just suggested with the green beans. If you do want to make the casserole, there's no shame in buying the canned soup. Do it. It's easier. It's fast. Um, if you really want to go all out and make the, the cream soup from scratch, you're going to have to ask the internet for a recipe, um, but it's it's very similar to just making like a white mushroom gravy or a white chicken gravy, depending on which one you prefer to use as a base. Um, let's see, anything else with the green beans that I feel like you guys really need to know? Nope, that's probably good on those. I mean, it's one of the simpler side dishes, and like I said, you can always substitute uh, Brussels sprouts or something else with it, doing it that really simple way with the almonds and... Uh, and garlic also gives you a slightly lighter side dish since so many of these holiday foods, um, whether you're doing Thanksgiving or Friendsgiving or just celebrating all the stuff that is currently available in Michigan right now, um, that's a nice light side dish because so many of the others are quite heavy. Stuffing. All right, whether you're making this inside the turkey or not, there are a bunch of different approaches. Personally, I tend to buy the bag because I don't usually have time to cut the bread and make the, cu the cubes myself. If you want to make your own from scratch, this is especially helpful if you're doing like gluten-free and it's hard to find gluten-free mix. We've got some in now. We may or may not run out. It's been in short supply this year. Um, but basically, take your preferred bread, a bread that you enjoy, cut it into a bunch of cubes, set it on low on a cookie sheet in your oven until they're crispy. Now you have bread cubes. Um, if you've got a dehydrator, you can do that in the dehydrator. The key is if you are making it this way, you want to make sure the oven is as low as possible because if they start to get cooked, it, they won't get as soft in your finished dressing. Um, some versions actually use bread crumbs as well. 
If you're gonna do breadcrumbs, then I would suggest cutting it into some pieces, getting it dry, and then pulsing it in your food processor to make the crumbs. Um, if you can't find a bag of crumbs you wanna buy. The nice thing about the cutting the cubes and doing it your own method is that you can do it gluten-free if you like, and it's, it's really pretty simple. It, you just treat them the same way, dry them in the oven. So once you have your dry cubes, whether you purchased a mix, <laughs> because frankly, you gotta compromise somewhere sometimes, um, or whether you're doing them from scratch, then the next thing you wanna do is saute your aromatic portion. Um, and I do this on the stove top just as everything else is getting done. Like I've done all the prep and I'm just throwing all these ingredients into various pans so everything's getting done at about the same time. Um, if you're doing it inside the turkey, then you would do this right before you stuff it. So you, chew. Pardon me guys, <laughs> that snuck up on me. Um, so I use uh, onions and celery and apples. I really like Honeycrisp. Um, Granny Smith or Honeycrisp works well for this because they're a firm apple uh, that can hold up to a little bit of cooking. I throw that in last after the onion and the celery have already softened in the butter or the vegan butter. But I like the apple because, again, that adds a little lighter note uh, to one of your side dishes that can be really heavy. Uh, some people like to use sausage or other things in there. If you're going to do that, again, the key is to make sure that is cooked through uh, before you go adding your bread to this. So if you're doing it from scratch, um, you'll want to have heated up on the side uh, broth. The exact proportions, you probably want at least half the volume of broth as you have volume of bread, because the bread is lighter than the liquid, so it's not exactly a one-to-one -one ratio. But if you have some extra, it's fine. You can use it to make soup later. Okay, so anyway, you've got your hot broth, and you've got your aromatics in the pan, and once those aromatics are like ready to rock, you're gonna pour in at least half your broth Get it up to boiling, not just hot, but boiling, and then you're going to throw in your bread and stir it. If it looks like you've got enough liquid in there now that everything's a little bit damp, you're probably fine. Just pop the lid on, slide it to the back of the stove, set it off on the side of the counter, and wait five or ten minutes. Give it another stir, and it's ready to serve. If it doesn't look like there's enough liquid that everything's kind of got at least a little bit of moisture on it, you can add a little bit more liquid while it's still on the stove. That's why you want some extra broth. Once it looks like it's, you don't want it to actually look wet yet, you just want it to look like there is liquid spread throughout because it's going to kind of absorb more and get softer. If it looks really wet at the point where you're putting that broth in, you're going to end up with stuffing that's kind of you can like make it into a ball like Play-Doh and chuck it at the wall. <laughs> so it should still look a tiny bit dry when you're setting it off to the side. The rest of the liquid from those aromatics and the broth is gonna soak into that bread and you're gonna give it that last little toss before you serve it. it and it works basically the same for gluten-free. Gluten -free. Um, you just have to potentially adjust your liquid ratio a little bit, which is why I suggest heating that broth separately and having it available to pour in. Um, if you cooked it in the bird, again, you're going to be checking the temperature when you take it out, and it's got to be at least at 165, just like the poultry has to be at. If you're making a vegan roast, um, there's no bones in the way, so you can slide the probe all the way to the center. If it's stuffed, you should be getting the probe all the way into the stuffing. So kind of judge by the width of the roast and make sure you're getting the probe into the center. Um, and it should be hitting whatever the required cooking temp is for that particular roast. And when you take it out to rest, remove that stuffing and set it in a separate dish. Because you don't want to be serving it right out of the bird. It's just messy and it's harder to make sure everything stays at a safe temperature before you go to put it away later. Pie. <laughs> okay, we're going to loop around to pie, which is one of my absolute favorite parts of Thanksgiving. I will eat pie at any time of the year over cake. It's just, I love it. Um, I love the crust, I love the filling, all the kinds of pie. Um, so the trickiest thing with pie is probably the crust. If you're making something classic like a, a pumpkin pie, you can just buy a pre-made crust. Nobody's going to judge you. Um, 
if you want to make it by hand when you're doing a single crust like that, there's a lot of easy press into pan recipes. That actually works really well for gluten-free as well. Look for a press in pie crust recipe and you can save yourself a lot of trouble by pressing the bottom half in and then rolling out or even crumbling on the top layer. Um, so you still get that crust flavor, but you don't have to worry as much about the texture. Now, if you want to do the full on roll out method, there's a lot of different fats that you can use. Sorry, I'm trying not to sneeze again on you guys. <laughs> there's something in the air. Um, if you want to do the classic roll out, my personal favorite fat for that is shortening. Um, you can get vegetable based shortening and it's really predictable for cooking with. It's easier to find than something like lard. There's a lot less risk that it will break and kind of fall out of the crust than there is with something like butter. Coconut oil doesn't tend to stick it together quite as well. So my personal recommendation is a vegetable based shortening. If you've got a pie cutter, um, which kind of looks like, like little wires on a handle, um, I should have grabbed it, I have one in the other room. But anyway, you, you can cut it together with the pie cutter um, or you can use a food processor. That's actually a super fast way. Um, take your, your flour and your fat and a little bit of salt and just put it in the food processor until it gets crumbly and starts sticking together. Um, there's a million different crust recipes out there so you can find your exact proportions that you want. But again, I recommend using a vegetable shortening. But don't kind of knead or use a stand mixer to mix the fat into the flour, that's when your crust will get really tough. So that's why I suggest that pie cutter tool um, or the food processor or forks or knives kind of going like this. You don't want to be stirring and you don't want to be using a mixer attachment. You won't end up with a nice tender crust. It won't be flaky. You'll be sad that you spent that much time on it. So once you have it come together, um, unless that, that fat was really cold when it went in, throw it in the fridge for a bit. It will be easier to work with it if it's somewhat chilled. Um, so you want to work it into a ball and then, or two if you're making a top and bottom crust because it's easier if you make two separate ones before you chill it. And then just put it in the fridge for a while until it's gotten kind of firm. Um, if it's too warm as you work with it, it'll start to get sticky, it'll tear easily, and it'll be hard to put into the pan. Um, so again, you can buy one, you can use a press in method, or you can go all out and roll out. Uh, if you're making a pie, I really suggest doing it at least the day before. It's a lot of stress to try and make the pie while you're making the dinner. We currently have canned pumpkin, um, but a lot of places are out and it's possible it could run out again um, before people are celebrating. So if you are wanting to make a pumpkin pie and you can't find pumpkin pie filling, I actually really recommend sweet potato. It's a slightly different flavor, but it's really good and very easy to just peel and bake a sweet potato and then mash it to get something that's this texture. You can also buy a pie pumpkin. Um, if you're gonna do that, cook it the same way you would a squash. Take out the top, scoop out the seeds, bake it till it's soft. If you can't find the sweet potatoes or the pumpkin, you can use basically any nice tasty squash. You can make a butternut pie. You can make a Hubbard pie. Um, a lot of canned pumpkin is other types of squash than just a regular pumpkin. Acorn squash, I mean, if it's a sweet, nice tasting squash that you would cook with like brown sugar and butter, you can use it as a pie filling. So get creative. If you can't find that classic pumpkin, there's a million other things you can fill that pie with. Personally, I love cherry. Um, if you're gonna make a cherry pie, use tart cherries. Tart Michigan cherries are of course the best, <laughs> um, but any tart cherries will do. If you use sweet cherries, that flavor ratio will be a little bit off. Um, other nice pies that you don't see quite as often are mixed berry pies. Um, so I'll actually got, get like the harvest berry blend that we have in the freezer. I think it's got like blueberries, blackberries, uh, strawberries in it. And that actually makes a really excellent pie filling. Um, I mean, strawberry or blueberry by themselves. Anything that doesn't have a crazy overwhelming amount of seeds makes a really nice fruit pie. Again, this is it's pretty easy to find recipes for those. Um, I recommend the 
uh, I think it's the Better Homes and Gardens cookbook, the plaid one. Most of you guys probably know what I'm talking about, the red plaid cookbook. That's got some really great fruit pie recipes in it. If you're gonna make an apple pie, choose your apples carefully. You want an apple that holds its texture and is not overly sweet. So like a Fuji or a Gala or a Red Delicious or a Golden Delicious, those are too sweet for pie. They're too soft. They're not gonna hold their texture and they won't hold up well to the mixture of sugar and spices. You'll end up with a really soft kind of gloppy, overly sweet filling. So you want like a Granny Smith, a Honey Crisp, um, maybe one of the local ones like a Liberty or a Crimson Crisp, something that's got a little bit of tartness to it and a firm kind of crispy texture. Um, even if it's a little too tart to eat, that's often good for pies. That's why Granny Smith makes such good pies because they hold together well and that extra tartness that they have blends well when you add that sugar and uh, seasoning to it. Okay, so those are most of the main things that people often wanna make. Cranberry sauce is another one. I buy it in the can. If you don't, um, there's a million different ways to make it, but the basics is buy your whole cranberries, whether they're fresh or frozen, and cook them with something sweet. Orange juice is really nice. Um, you can just use sugar, but you're basically going to cook them with your preferred sweetener until they start to get soft. Like I said, orange juice is a really good one. Even if you use sugar, a little orange zest can really pick up the flavor uh, that you'll get in that cranberry sauce. But it's kind of hard to screw up. Just try not to add too much liquid. And if you do, keep cooking it until there's less liquid in it. And you will have cranberry sauce. So that's an easy one. Um, vegan substitutions. So I've talked a little bit about vegan roasts and how you might want to use, say, like vegan uh, sour cream in your mashed potatoes. You know, have a couple of sticks of vegan butter on hand. I like Earth Balance a lot. Um, Miyoko is a really excellent one as well. But most of these things can just be made one for one. Simply use your preferred uh, vegan or vegetarian dairy product. One that can be a tiny bit tricky is heavy cream. My preferred uh, replacement is the canned type of coconut milk. Um, if a recipe calls for coconut milk and you think it would normally be heavy cream, you want the kind that's in a can. If it calls for coconut milk and you think it would normally be the kind you pour over breakfast, you want the kind that comes in a box. Now it does have a slight coconut flavor, but this is the advantage that like, you can literally whip it just like whipping cream. I just refrigerate it until a little bit of extra liquid separates out and then just take that top portion and literally whip it in a stand mixer like you would with, with regular heavy cream. Um, I don't think you can actually make coconut butter out of it, but I've never tried, so it's possible. Um, but you definitely can make whipped cream. You can also use this in anything else that you would want that like delicious, unctuous, heavy cream flavor in, but it does have a little bit of a coconut taste. So I prefer it in desserts um, to things like mashed potatoes. In something like mashed potatoes, I would probably use like an unsweetened um, vegan yogurt or better yet, a vegan sour cream, um, some vegan butter. Or, oh, if you do want to use something that's a bit more liquid, then I would suggest going for something like an unsweetened uh, vegan creamer, something that's meant for coffee because they do tend to have less of um, the flavor of whatever they are made of, whether it's coconut or almond or cashew. They won't tend to have quite as strong of a taste as something like the canned coconut milk does. Um, there aren't a lot of classic Thanksgiving things that require cheese. But if you did want to make something like a cheese ball, uh, then I would recommend just getting a nice block vegan cheese. Um, Violife is, is a favorite of mine. Uh, you can use the Daya, like their, their um, I think it's Jalapeno Havarti is the name of it, is a really nice flavor. And you can just do like you would with a, a classic uh, dairy cheese ball and run it through your food processor with some vegan butter and kind of coated on the outside with some herbs or toasted nuts. So it's, it's pretty simple. I mean, most of the vegan uh, Thanksgiving or Friendsgiving or general holiday cooking is just a one-to-one -one substitution. If there's something specific that you're really hoping to do, let me know. 
I've probably experimented with it. I mean, I just made vegan creme brulee the other day, uh, and I did use this delicious coconut milk, and that worked out really great. So if you want a second opinion, feel free to run it by me, and I'll do my best to help you out. Um, Gluten-free substitutions. Again, it's getting easier and easier. Um, the things to watch out for are going to be in like packet mixes and stuff that have a thickener in them. There's a possibility they could have gluten in them. Um, with the stuffing, you know, if you can't find a gluten-free stuffing mix, you can use gluten-free croutons. If you can't find those, just cube the bread, dry it in the oven like I suggested earlier. Um, for the pie crusts, you can buy pre-made gluten-free pie crusts, which we sell um that work great they're super easy you just fill make yourself a nice little crumble topping so you don't have to worry about a top crust and and bake as is if you don't want to go that route i really suggest the press in crusts it's a lot easier to get the right combination of flours to stick together in the right way um, if you want to try using your classic pie crust recipe i would say the bob's red mill one-to-one -one flour is probably the best gluten-free option is it already has a nice mixture of flours and binders to give you a texture that's going to be the most similar to a classic pie crust without purchasing one in advance um okay so kind of going back into leftovers so like i said earlier this is a time of year where Fresh local turkeys or even frozen local turkeys, organic turkeys, that kind of thing. This is one of the cheapest meats that you can actually get right now, in, especially in natural food, but even generally, if you're getting your turkey somewhere else, it's actually gonna be a lot cheaper than beef or pork or lamb or any of those other things. Um, so you, I suggest buying a big turkey and making a bunch of really great stuff with the leftovers or even buying an extra if you have the freezer space uh, you can make it at you know christmas or yule or hanukkah or kwanzaa or whatever you're celebrating during that time of year or you can save it for you know february when everything's super dreary and you decide you want to make something fancy but it doesn't just have to be a whole turkey that you're slicing the breast off of and then not making anything else out of the first thing that I'll do, okay, not the first thing, let's be honest, the day that I cook all this, I'm eating it and then I'm sitting down for a long while. <laughs> I'm not doing it that day. I'm going to refrigerate the carcass and deal with it the next day um, because we all need a little bit of downtime, especially if you're the one doing all the cooking. But you want to make sure that it is refrigerated and within an hour of coming out of the oven, like it's... Not like on Thanksgiving, we suddenly get a pass on food safety and things don't have to stay at a proper temperature. Even if you're just shoving all the containers in the fridge and sorting it out later, try and make sure stuff is not sitting around at room temperature for an unsafe period of time. It, it doesn't, yeah, there's no sudden magical holiday pass on 40 degrees and above being the danger zone. That's still the case. So next day. I go into the freezer or in the fridge typically and I put on a little pair of rubber gloves because otherwise like my hands smell like turkey and garlic because like I told you I use a lot of garlic for like a day and my cat won't leave me alone <laughs> but you can do it however you feel comfortable um, I get myself two bowls I've got the dish that the turkey is in and then I've got a bowl to each side in one of them I throw the skin and the bones and the bits that I'm not gonna eat as is and in the other, I throw the meat. I pull it off in chunks. Sometimes I'll even do two, one for dark meat and one for light meat because they have a different amount of fat in them and you can use them for different kinds of things. Um, so anyway, as I'm going through, I'm sorting it into the different bowls. And when I get down to the end, I've got an empty dish. If there's any bits of like drippings or fat or whatever left, I throw it in with the, the bones and the skin. If you wanna make broth with that, which is what I usually do, throw it all in a pot put in enough water to cover, turn it on just high enough to simmer, set a lid on it, and then walk away for most of the rest of the day. If the liquid level starts to get too low, add some more. Um, at the end of the day, or at least after a couple of hours when you're done cooking it, you just get yourself a strainer. Um, I recommend a mesh strainer, but whatever works for you. Um, I'll scoop out the big chunks with like a spoon or some tongs and set those aside because they will be hot. You don't want to throw them directly in your trash. There's potentially you could like melt your trash bag, which is gross. Um, 
but so I'll, I'll throw them aside to cool off a little bit before I throw them out. And then you're just gonna pour the rest of that through the strainer. So any little bits of skin or bones or herbs or whatever that are left in there are gone and you're left with just broth. You can either toss that in the freezer and make your soup later, or you can go ahead and start adding your leftover vegetables and that handily pre-sorted and shredded turkey meat into it. Dark meat works great for soup because it's got a lot of fat. So between the bones and the skin and the soup, you're gonna end up with this wonderful, like silky, fatty texture to the soup. It will literally, when refrigerated, gel up um, because of the bones and everything. So it's gonna be, you're making your own bone broth that way. You're getting all the goodness out of the turkey. So whether you use it right away or save it for later, doesn't really matter. Um, it's a great way to get extra out of all those bones. Now, you also have a couple containers of meat. Sure, you're gonna eat some leftovers for a day or two, but you know, you can't probably eat all of it in sandwiches unless you've got a big family, um, which a lot of people are cooking for smaller groups this year. So I like to freeze it in kind of meal size portions. And what I will do is I'll do like a mix of white and dark meat and put some leftover gravy in it and freeze that in like a meal size portion. And I can just heat that up later and put it on sandwiches. I could use it as filling for a pot pie. Um, I can use it as the base for another batch of soup. So if you've got that, that extra gravy, that's a really great way to use it. Another thing you can do is, especially with the dark meat, you can take that and again, I, I would freeze this in portions so that you can use it later and not have to worry about just eating turkey for like five days um, because you it does, it's like anything else, you can only keep it in the fridge for so long. But I'll take that dark meat and cook that with taco seasoning. And that's actually really tasty. You can use it as a filling in like, um, like a quesadilla. You can use it by itself, like in a tortilla. You can serve it with rice. Um, you can add some extra, like a can of uh, fire roasted tomatoes along with that taco seasoning and end up with this really like thick, delicious um, kind of chili taco hybrid that you can make with the turkey. Uh, the white meat works really well in soup. You can also go ahead and use that, like I said, as a filling in something like a quesadilla, maybe without as much heavy seasoning because it doesn't have as much fat. Uh, you can use that again in pot pies. If you wanna make a pot pie, just get a little broth, thicken it up, throw your turkey and your vegetables into that pre-made pie crust, and you can even put your leftover mashed potatoes on top and make it shepherd's pie style and cook it that way. So there's a lot of different things that you can do with these leftovers, especially if you just sort through it all once and freeze it in a couple of separate portions. Um, it's actually surprisingly easy to go through your leftovers that way, and it'll save you a lot of trouble later. You'll be like, wow, I already baked this, you know, or cooked this a month ago, and now it's just ready to rock. So there's a few for the turkey. Um, and like I said, the mashed potatoes makes a cool topping if you decide to make something like a pot pie. Um, you can also make them into potato pancakes. I mean, personally, I never have leftover mashed potatoes. I literally eat them by the cereal bowl full until they're gone. But you can mix them uh, with like sweet corn if you're a person who likes to have corn as a side dish and make them into little pancakes and like fry them in the pan like a latke. Uh, and those are really tasty. You can use it to thicken your turkey soup. If you're making a batch of turkey soup, you can mix in those mashed potatoes and it will add some, some thickness and some starch and texture to the broth of that soup. Um, Another one that you can do is your sweet potatoes and cranberry sauce. You can take those, run them through the fruit processor together, and use them to make another pie. Like, they actually make a really tasty pie. There's a recipe on our website for making pie out of leftover sweet potatoes and cranberry sauce that I made for the first time some years ago, and that actually turned out amazing. So you can go ahead and rope all of these leftovers together and use them in a bunch of different ways. And that's, again, why it's probably worth uh, either getting a slightly bigger turkey or an extra one, even if you've got the room for it. And then finally, this I'm gonna kind of wrap it up here because there's a million more things I could talk about, but the day is getting away from us. Um, if you don't wanna do any of these things, check out our catering menu. We can make just the sides, uh, we can make one or two of the sides. We can make you a whole individual dinner, whether you want that to be uh, classic, vegan, vegetarian, gluten-free, just let us know. Uh, we can make 
all of the sides and the turkey uh, for I think up to four to six people. So just give us a call and let us know. We are happy to take care of that for you if all of this seems a bit overwhelming. Hopefully you guys enjoyed this video. Again, if you have more questions, just shoot them to me in the comments, in an email, call the store, stop in, and we are happy to help. Whatever you're celebrating, however, wherever, and with however many people, I hope that you have a great time and it all turns out delicious. Have a beautiful Friday, everybody.